Hi, my name is Uri Aviv. I'll be talking today with Asaf Bartov, founding editor of Project Ben Yehuda, and Shani Evenstein Sigalov, co-editor alongside Asaf, and chairperson of the Hebrew Literature Digitization Society, the nonprofit that supports and uh, manages the project. Hi, I'm Shani. And I'm Asaf. And we are from Project Ben Yehuda. Give us a brief intro into the project, please. Sure. Um, project Ben Yehuda is a volunteer-based free and open digital library that expands the access to Hebrew texts since 1999. We offer a comprehensive library of texts from ancient times to contemporary writing in a variety of genres, poetry, prose, letters, memoirs, and translations into Hebrew of works from world literature. We seek to not only preserve older Hebrew works, not only to publish them online for free and without advertising so that they're accessible to the public, but also to go the extra mile and expose them to new audiences, find new readers for these older texts. I would say today we have the largest digital searchable free and online um, open Hebrew library in the world with over 25,000 literary works uh, by more than 450 writers. We serve hundreds and thousands of people from all over the world every month, and that includes teachers, students, researchers, and of course, avid readers. Our project was inspired by Project Gutenberg and follows the philosophy of free knowledge and free software. Over the years, more than 1,500 volunteers have participated in curating our cultural heritage, making it available by the public for the public. Do you include, like Project Gutenberg, only public domain texts? That's how we started, and we take copyright very seriously. I thank you for this question. Uh, we obey the law. We do not publish any copyrighted material without permission. We started with purely public domain works for several years, but over a decade ago, we began proactively approaching copyright owners, the people responsible for in-copyright works, to seek and receive their permission to make those works accessible before copyright expires. And that is how we gained permission to make available to the public the works of such poets and authors as Avraham Shlonsky, Nathan Alterman, and many others, and also of thinkers and politicians like the first Israeli Prime Minister, David Ben-Gurion. And as of today, the percentage of copyrighted work that we make accessible by permission is about 40% of the total library. It's a huge number and it's a major difference from Project Gutenberg, which is really interesting. Um, you mentioned volunteers, let's dive a little bit into that. How many and who are they? Our volunteers are our biggest asset, really. Um, we currently have about 250 active volunteers, people who have a task right now uh, working on the project. And they are a highly diverse group, uh, ranging from uh, middle school uh, students to uh, professionals in various fields to senior citizens. Um, there's a definite majority of women among the volunteers, and almost half of them are retirees. That's fascinating and a bit unusual for a digital technological project. Can you share some lessons from overseeing a volunteer base, which includes a large number of seniors? Senior citizens are great volunteers for us because they have time, they have motivation, and um, very often they have a connection to this older Hebrew literature, uh, much of which is uh, something they grew up reading or have some uh, um, sentiment towards. So they have motivation. Uh, what we need to make sure of is that they also have some minimal level of computer literacy, which is required to do the work, to handle files, a web browser, um, to be able to type into a, a document, um, uh, including um, adding footnotes, for example, which is required in many of our texts. But as long as they can do that, uh, we can use them and um, we mentor them, we support them, we make sure they have those skills um, so that they can do the work in the project. And, and there is a continuous uh, mentorship uh, going on uh, 
uh, with our volunteers. The second challenge that we have, and I, I would say every volunteer project has, and that is retention. Mm. And so we overcome that challenge of retention in, I would say, two main ways. One is the human touch, right? We take pride in actually knowing and creating a relationship with our volunteers. Everything is done on a human scale. We know who they are. We know what they like and dislike. We actually match the right assignment to the right volunteer, which is an art by itself. And um, we basically take pride in the fact that we're not an assembly, uh, industrial assembly line, right? But uh, more of a communal craft studio. Um, mm -hmm. And that brings me, the, the communal part, brings me to our community because I would say that is one of the most important things that um, differentiates us or kind of make us unique in what we do. And that is we were able to create and maintain a community of volunteers. We make sure because that the volunteering could be really a lonely process, right? It's every single person in their PJs, in front of the computer at <laughs> night, in the morning, but it's, it's a lonely work. And so we have to make sure that we connect these volunteers. We create, we have a really lively and, and vibrant Facebook group. We have ongoing support where we help them, we give them tips, we help them improve their own skills. We have online events um, and offline events when, when we don't have COVID um, and uh, we have workshops. So all of that creates a sense of community and, and, and a sense that we're all doing this amazing, incredible work of preserving our heritage together. So it gives a sense of purpose and meaning to, to all of that. That's great. Um, let's discuss what the volunteers actually do. What's the core work um, that the volunteer team does for the project? The project uh, is, is entirely online, of course. Uh, I mean, what you see in the site is electronic texts, but getting them there is, is quite a process and it does have offline um, elements to it because we have to start by doing bibliographical research to find out what works are even out there and create lists of authors and then lists of works per author using traditional bibliographic sources. And then we have to locate physical copies for each text or work, and then obtain those physical copies and scan them. Once we've scanned the books, everything else is already digital and can be done online. But this crucial bit of obtaining the physical copy in order to produce scans uh, is labor intensive and, and requires uh, time and travel. Once we have those scans, volunteers are assigned chunks of those scans. They type them on, at their computer into uh, a, a standard word processing document and uh, upload it to our system as a document. Other volunteers then proofread that text, comparing it with the source scans. And finally, when the uh, typing has been proofread and is, is approved, we format it a little and we upload it to the digital library for, for the public to see. Of course, the greatest part of the effort is the actual typing of the text. So I guess the question that's on a lot of people's minds is, um, why is all of this done manually? Um, why not replace the wonderful volunteers with wonderful robots? Or to put it more seriously and technically, I guess, um, why not use um, OCR software? Thank you for that question. It, it makes perfect sense that people are curious why we're not um, replacing our volunteers with uh, robots or with OCRs. Um, I would say the simple answer is that OCRs or any other technological um, solution for now is simply not good enough. What we have learned by trying this, and we have tried a few times, is that using an OCR uh, gives us a result of roughly 95% accuracy. Now that sounds a lot, but it sounds really good. But what it actually means is that every 20 characters, there will be a mistake and not simple mistakes that humans do, but silly mistakes, right? Or unintelligent mistakes that um, machines make. And that is quite annoying for our volunteers. So what we found is in terms of our volunteer motivations, it's, um, 
much easier for them to type a text from the beginning to, to the end rather than correct these silly mistakes that the machines are making. So we need to save some, some questions for our offstage event, but um, for one last topic, what makes um, Project Ben Yehuda stand out um, compared to similar digitized libraries around the world? Yes, we, we are, of course, a digital library like other digital libraries, but I think we also stand out, um, especially in how we treat the uh, texts in the project leading to uh, a significant advantage in discoverability. The texts that we put in the digital library are not just um, cataloged by author and title of the book, and that's it. Uh, we actually catalog, we treat each individual work within the book as a first-class citizen. So every single poem in a poetry collection, every article in an, in an anthology or a book of essays um, gets its own catalog entry, which means it can be cataloged more richly. Its topic can be specified. Its links to other texts, as we've mentioned. And so that makes these individual texts a lot more discoverable when people are looking for the work. I'd like to invite you to join us Saturday for our offstage event, Project Ben Yehuda, Happy Accidents, where we will elaborate on the ideas presented here and dive into the project story. You can ask us anything from things like how the project came to be, what our current stats are, how we curate and prioritize our work, and what are the goals for the coming years? To, of course, how you can participate yourselves and contribute to what we do. For all of this and more, join our event as we explore the magic of our digital library together. This coming Saturday, May 22nd, 9 p.m. Israel time, 8 p.m. Central European time, 6 p.m. UTC. Shami Asaf. Thank you so much for your time. And thank you all of you for listening and participating. Zoom with us. Thank you.